All right. How about that? Y'all give God glory for some students. They're not ashamed. Well, we love you guys. As y'all take your, uh, go back to your seats um, as they're making their way back and you're being seated. Um, and all the Baptists said, whew, thank you. <laughs> I want you, uh, if you were in connection, uh, in our connection group ministry, uh, what you're, you have already seen, but for the sake of trying to make sure that everyone is, uh, we're keeping the information flowing uh, as God's calling us to chase after him, I want you to uh, watch uh, um, a video that a lot of labor, a lot of love, a lot of time went into to summarize where we're headed. This, this is the day, the door that we're walking through as we start making our way to the apex of hearing from God. It is a financial expression, but the financial expression comes from a uh, faith revelation. So I want you to turn your uh, attention, if you would, to the screen for just a moment. We are endeavoring under the banner and the belief, a promise from the Word of God called Standing on the Promises. And it's really a cumulative effect of where we've been as we've watched God do the miraculous. Once we stood on that piece of property at Tazewell and we watched God not only provide the miracle to make it available, but then to bring the funds to pay for it, we began to understand we were standing on promises that God had already written in His Word and in the heart of His people called Fairview. You are a part of watching God unfold. As we walk in faith, we begin to stand on the promises. God brings revelation as we walked in that revelation. He brought affirmation to what was going on in our midst. We have remained fearless and forward and focused. We, we've done that. But in the midst of that, God has done something in the heart of the body. That's why we call this standing on the promises because we really are quite literally in the most marvelous dynamic experiencing God's provision in the midst of walking in the light that he's given us. The question is, why now? Why would we want to do this? And there, there's an obvious. I mean, beloved, if, if you attend Fairview, you understand you're, you're parking in the most inconvenient places. We are packing people in with overflow and we love our online campus. We understand all of that and we're very thankful for the facilities that we have. But now is the time because as Dr. Falwell would say, as Dr. Rogers taught us through the years, we got the big mo on our side. There's momentum. God's hoisted our sails. He sent the wind. This is our season. This is the time to put the gates back up, build the walls and watch God do in a miraculous way what can only be credited to God's glory. Can you imagine, beloved, that 141 years ago, just across Emory, just across the street from where we're standing today, a small group of believers led of God started Lick Skillet Baptist Church. Now, we get tickled at that, but there was a reason. That, that was an identifier for this region. Now, 141 years later, we are sitting on a piece of property that was donated, committed, for the cause of the kingdom. A little over 30 years ago, this church was literally condemned. The facility was no longer legally permissible to meet in. You had to believe God for a financial miracle to repair a building that had been condemned. You believed by faith what God was gonna manifest in finances. And as you walked in the light that God gave you, just the privilege to love and to lead you, do you realize that in just a little over three and a half years, 1,000 people have declared by covenant membership, they've made this their church home. Over 600 have followed the Lord in believer's baptism. But, but those are just numbers. Let's talk about the lives. What about the seasons when God set down unscheduled meetings, six days of just a touch of God, and at the end of those days, 150 souls troubled the water, five troughs stirring with the glory of God You've not only followed God to become a Northeast Knoxville influence, now God has touched us and we are a regional impacting church. Literally across the nation and around the world, pastors tune in weekly to watch because you have become a living epistle. We're not talking about just a building. We're talking about a philosophy. We're not talking about just duplicating facilities. We're talking about expanding faith. So when you look at the 
the renderings, when you look at what the architect has tried to capture physically and what God's doing in our heart spiritually, I need you to understand that we're not building for those who are here. We're building for those that we've not reached yet. Christy and I are praying right now about what God's gonna do. We're not gonna be the same when this journey's over. And the end result is not that we're gonna be at Taswell in a building. The end result is God's gonna do something in us to prepare us for the building. We're the body. So I need you to be praying. Pray about what God is gonna do in these weeks to come. We're launching into a very systematic, strategic, purposeful schedule to get our hearts ready for what God's gonna do. The Apostle Paul, if I could say it this way, Pastor Paul said to his people in Corinthians, purpose in your heart. Go on and ask God. Remember, beloved, God never plays hide and go seek. We're not talking about equal gifts. We're talking about equal sacrifice. We're not talking about the amount of the money. We're talking about the intimacy with the Father. What is it that God wants you to believe Him for? God wants to stretch us. He wants us to spare not. So I'm going to pray. God's going to give me light on prioritizing and being a part of this journey. We are going to believe God, not man, not the bank, not the calculator, not the bank book. We're going to believe God. Fairview, if there's ever been a time for us to trust God, if we've ever brought back the fruit from the land, are there giants? Yes. Are they going to be intimidating and imposing? Absolutely. Are we believing God for a, for a financial miracle that some will scoff at? Absolutely we are. But do we not hold in our hands the very fruit of God's faithfulness? Let's step across this Jordan. Let's walk into this land and let's watch God do the impossible so that the generations to come, should Christ tarry, there will come a day when we've stepped into glory and they'll talk about what God did in those days when the heavens were rent and Fairview believed God for the impossible. Wow, wow. So you saw some, um, obviously, you, you got a little bit of a tease on some of the artistic renderings, architectural renderings. Those are somewhat preliminary. Uh, th what they're doing, what we're doing, is we're trying to bring the building into an expression of the ministry. So many churches build a building um, that becomes a shoe that won't let the foot grow. And then the, re the ministry forever is constrained by the restrictions of the building. We're trying to tell the building, you're not going to define us. We're, it's going to be a tool for the work of ministry. Did you notice, perhaps, if you weren't in Connection Group, uh, you, you would not have uh, been privy to the insight as Pastor Seach was putting all of the, the information out there. Did you notice the tower at the cross uh, on the front of the building? That is, that's a prayer tower that um, it's a rather small, it's not a, it's not a big room. You've heard me speak uh, frequently about the influence of a lady by the name of Bertha Smith. Never met her. Miss Bertha died uh, when she was 100 years old. She died before I ever uh, came to Christ. But her, her legacy, being dead yet she speaketh, um, she had a prayer tower in her, in her home, spiraled up or over the top of her home. And that is what that is based on. They'll, you can get 10 to maybe 15 people in there. And what we will do is the windows, obviously, is open to the north, the south, the east, the west. Uh, that's going to be the apex. Now, the building is, is, is going to be phenomenal. You're going to get more information. I don't want you to get fixated on that so much as to understand we're in the middle of God doing something that only God could do. Amen. Can I get a witness? Amen. Amen. So... Let's do this. Go to Isaiah, very quickly, go to Isaiah chapter 43. And um, I want to show you from God's word what God um, is speaking. Y'all know I just got back from um, the Holy Land. Uh, we just took a, a teaching tour over there. I taught um, prophecy. And we just absolutely had a visitation from God. Every day was a new, deep, intimate revelation from him. And part of that uh, in my own life came out of Isaiah 43. We got in about midnight last night, and um, uh, I ought to be jet lagged. And I feel like that um, I feel like I've rested for a week. It, it's uh, just been incredible to be back with you and to be in the midst of what God's doing. 
uh, in these days to come from that promised land to this promised land. That's a sweet thing. And touch down uh, on the ground, first thing we found out was UT. <laughs> One. So I know that's not spiritual, but <laughs> um, anyway. So um, if you've been a Vol fan very long, <laughs> it's almost spiritual. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, look at Isaiah chapter 43. Just stay seated where you are. I, I, I fear that I have vex some of you, wore you out by making you stand up so much. So look at Isaiah chapter 43 for, for time and, and context. Will you help me, beloved? Look at verse 14 and uh, let's get a hold of the flow of the text. Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans uh, who cry uh, in the ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters, which bringeth forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched. Uh, the King James says as a toe, it means, it, it means quite literally to be snuffed out like a candle. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold... I will do a new thing. Will you read that with me, beloved? Behold, I will do a new thing. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. Oh, God, open our eyes to see beyond the natural. Open our ears to hear what the Spirit says. Give us a heart to obey, feet that will walk in the way. Hide me behind the cross in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is what I want to do ever so quickly. Uh, very practical message. I want to talk to you first uh, and perhaps the least engaging, inviting part of the message. Uh, if you're new to the things of, of faith or you're, you're not yet become a, a deep diver in the Word of God, I want to talk to you about the situation of the letter. You're, you're dealing with a man that lived 750 plus years before the birth of our Savior. His name's Isaiah. And uh, he is a prophet that is called the eagle eye prophet by the rabbinical scholars. He had such incredible advanced prophetic perception. He was able, by, his, by the virtue of walking with God, to preach a word that was, that was so advanced, he was getting a generation ready that would get a generation ready for something that was coming. Does that sound vaguely familiar to you? So here's the situation. You remember Isaiah, the book Isaiah is a small Bible, 66 books, 66 chapters. How many books are in the Bible? Woo, you're smarter than the average Baptist. So there's 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah, 66 books in the whole uh, canonized Bible. There are 39, the first 39 chapters of Isaiah are about uh, rebellion and about the, the results of the rebellion against God. We oftentimes read the Old Testament like God's some ogre. He's some distant autocratic deity, and he's waiting to catch you having a good time, and then he's going to pop you with a lightning bolt, right? We tend to do that. But the truth of the matter is, if you really read it through the eyes of redemption, what is happening is the people have been given a choice. They've been told over and over, if, if you'll come with me, if you'll walk with me, if you'll have intimacy with me, don't let the houses that I'm going to give you that you didn't buy get in the way of making it a home. Don't enjoy the wells you didn't dig, drinking from them that you missed the water of life. Don't let the land become your, your, your priority and miss the Lord. And he kept telling them, come with me, come with me, come with me, come with me. And they kept saying, well, we'd rather have the stuff than you. Sound vaguely familiar? So when you get to Isaiah chapter 43, the first 39 chapters are about rebellion and they're about God's, God's, the results of rebelling against God. So you're right about chapter 43. If I had to title this sermon, I, I would title it this way. You, you had to be a little bit older, not old. I didn't say old, but you had to be a little bit older to, to know what I'm going to say. I would title it this way. Hear ye, hear ye, Court is in. Oh, some of you been there. <laughs> so, so really, that, that's what's going on here. God has said, "Look, you've been doing it your way. You, you've decided that that the abundance of stuff is more important than the intimacy of my presence." So He has. Li he's quite literally. If you read the whole book, He has summons them to court, and He wants them to come to a to a conclusion, a verdict. So, in in chapter forty three, there is a situation, and here's the odd thing. 
The odd thing is they're doing great. The nation is booming. If, if you could look at the, the surrounding, the econ- the, let me say it this way. The Dow's popping 25,000. They Everybody in the land's got a two-camel garage. <laughs> and there's a chicken in every pot. Right? They're doing great. And the, the issue, the challenge for Isaiah is this. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. God, do you want me to say to them that this is what's coming they're in the midst of prosperity, and you're, you want me to tell them there's some pain on the way, but you want me to tell them that in the midst of their prosperity, the pain that's coming is not your fault. You're not the one that's putting them in pain, but there is pain coming because when you choose the creation over the creator, there's consequences. You can't listen to me. People get so mad at me when I'm never here. People never get mad at me here, but when I'm out traveling abroad, people get so mad at me because when I'm preaching is specifically in prophecy conferences, and, and I, I will talk about the fact that I believe biblically America's already in judgment. When I'm, when I'm out teaching prophecy, I'll get two, quest, two questions. I don't care if there's a thousand. I get two every time. Number one, um, is America mentioned in prophecy? No. If she is, it's general out of Zechariah chapter 12, chapter 14. All nations are gathered together against Israel, and, and that's, that's not a good thing because we're not mentioned. But second question will be this. When is God going to judge America? We're aborting the unborn. We are applauding what God calls an abomination. We're redefining everything. What's right, we, we call wrong. What's wrong, we call right. And they'll ask me, when's God going to judge America? Beloved, he, he, we're already judged. We're in judgment. You Listen, people get mad at me and they'll say, well, I don't understand why we have columbines. I don't understand why our kids are killing each other because we told God to get out of the school system. You can't have it both ways, beloved. You can't have God don't come to our school system and we don't want 10 basically arbitrary, you know, ambiguous rules. I mean, think about the 10 commandments. Thou shall not kill. Is it not, is it, does, what, I mean, Stevie Wonder could see something's up here. Do you understand what I'm saying? You take it down and they start killing each other. And then we get mad at God. God, we don't understand why our kids are bringing guns to school and killing each other. Well, you told me you didn't want me in the school. So you can't have it both ways. You can't throw me out and then blame me for what you let in. That, that, what Isaiah's doing in the situation, he's saying this. Right now, you're living in the middle of, 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 of a flow of blessing And here's the danger. Here's the situation. If you parallel this with the last church mentioned in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, there's seven churches, I believe. There's seven pictures in the last days. The last church is called the church of Laodicea. The word Laodicea means ruled by the people. I got jet lag, so I'm not going to touch that, okay? We're just going to move past that. It means ruled by the people, which is a contrast to not being led of the Spirit, not being led of the Spirit. Listen to their testimony service, Revelation chapter 3. Listen to their, listen to their testimony service. They're, they're, you, let's just peek in for a moment and listen to what they're saying. They're saying, oh, we've carpeted the floors, we've padded the pews, we've air-conditioned the air, we've got buildings to meet in, eat in, play in, worship in, we've got buildings, we've got rooms where you can macrame, we've got rooms where you can study the Bible, we've got rooms where women can put on these tight clothes, jump up and down like jello, and call it aerobics. They got them. When I first moved here, <laughs> my study was here. I, I, had to, I had to do it here. We hadn't bought a home yet. So I, 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 I would get up two or three in the morning and come over to my study. First few months here, I come up the top up here from, and there was a, there's a room in one of these buildings up here with a bunch of windows. And it's like four or five o'clock in the morning and there was all these women up there in psychedelic, psychedelic tights. And they were jumping up and down. And I called my wife and I said, something's wrong. People in bright yellow jumping up and down. She said, it's aerobics. Go to your study. (laughs) Listen to the testimony. This is what they say. We are well increased with many goods and we have need of nothing. And guess where Jesus is? The door, stay with me, come on. The door is standing outside the door. They don't even know he's not in the house. 
They're doing so well with the budget and the building. They've done so well with the programs and the parking lot. They are flourishing with the methodology of man. They have decided that by might, by power, not by my spirit, saith the Lord, we could build a church like Sam's Club. We, we could build an organization like the Elks. We could get people to come and we'll give you a latte for your bate and give you a seat to stay a and so we get your money. That's a rape right there. So do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? So they don't even know that God's not in the house. So Isaiah says, wait, 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 wait. Here's the situation. Because you have rejected him and only want what you can get from him, there's some consequences coming. So that's the situation. Look at your neighbor and say, that's the situation. Now, now let, me, let, me, let, me, let me give you the invitation. Look at, look at verse 19. Look at verse 19. And I want you to, to, to look at um, the first word. Behold, let's read it together one more time. Behold, I will do a new thing. So here's, here's, here's the invitation. That word behold, quite literally, it, it means come over here and look. Come over here and change your perception and your vantage point. The, the, the word there, it, it, it's, it's so powerful. I, I really don't, in the English, it's, it's hard to capture what he's saying. He's just shifted them through the fact that, for example, look at verse 2 of 43. When thou pass through the waters, when thou passest through the waters, when you go through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Now, here's the deal. We read that as New Testament believers, and we relish in that. We rejoice in that because we received that promise. Here's what we oftentimes don't understand. He didn't say, if you go through the fire. He didn't say, if you get in the flood. He said, I need you to understand something. You're going through this. A time out on the playing field. Let me simply say this. I'm working on a series of messages after the first of the year. God's really begun to reveal to me there is this doctrine, there is this false idea being pushed on, on, a, on really on American Christianity that, that God causes bad stuff. No. Now, listen, let me tell you how sovereign he is. He's so sovereign that, that even when we allow bad stuff or the enemy brings bad stuff, he's so God that he can take the stuff that's supposed to hurt us to use it to help us. He can take the stuff that was supposed to, to break us or burn us and use it to bless us. And, and, and the bottom line is really this. Well, if God is so good, how can, how can it hurt so bad? We live in a time where the, there is a sovereign decree with an enemy that's permitted to operate in this realm. I'm going to get into all that other than say this. If, if you don't understand the situation, you can't change your perception because we tend to judge God based on the temporal instead of the eternal. We tend to judge God based on what we're going through now instead of what he's promised to take us to later. You understand what I'm saying? So, for example, let me, let me see if I can illustrate this. I recently read about a, um, a highly decorated border Officer, He's a uh, border patrol officer on the southern border of our uh, great United States of America. Uh, three decades of just stellar uh, service. He was coming to the end of his career, and he kind of had a reputation. He just had an intuitive ability to know when somebody was up to something bad. Somebody was smuggling something. Just, he just knew, and he was legendary in the southern border uh, as an officer. About two years before he retired... <laughs> A gentleman started making his way back and forth over the border uh, in pickup, in, you know, come through in a pickup truck. And this guy just knowing, three, you know, 30 years of this, he knew <laughs> this dude is smuggling something. I mean, you know that you know even if you don't know how you know. Do you know? We, we, gentlemen, we call it women's intuition. <laughs> you big moron, like you think you're going to get away with it. Fess it up, Jack. Listen, she may not even know what you did, but she knows that she knows that you know that she knows. So just confess it, right? Well, he has that going on, you know, to some extent. So about two years before he, he um, is going to retire, he starts honing in on this guy. 
And it isn't long until um, he's at his wit's end. In fact, uh, they start pulling him, the guy, off to the side. They put the dogs on the truck. They put the mirrors under the truck. They x-ray the truck. Nothing. Next time he comes back, they take the wheels off the truck, the tires off the wheels. They take the bumper off the truck. They take the dash out of the truck. This goes on for about a year. Nothing. And he is absolutely exasperated. He knows as a 30-year veteran, this dude's up to no good. So right before he retires, he has found nothing. This guy's crossed the border for the last two years, dozens upon dozens of times. They have done everything down to tear the stuffing out of the trucks. Last week before he, re he retires, gets his watch and goes home. Uh, I don't know if this translates in East Tennessee, but he's going to wait for the eagle to fly. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so work better with that first crowd. So um, he go, he, the guy comes across the border. He pulls up and he says to him, Listen, for two years, I know and you know that I know. You're smuggling something. And the guy grins because the officer's reputation is now on the line. He's no longer kind of the top dude. And he says to the man, he says, here's, here's what I want to say to you. I, I give you my word as an officer. I won't tell. But before I retire, I need to know what and how you're smuggling it across the border. And the guy looked at him and said, pickup trucks. <laughs> work with me. Come on, work with me. He'd been, he wasn't smuggling drugs, heroin, marijuana. He was smuggling pickup trucks. Y'all a little slow this morning. I'm the one on jet lag. I ain't slept in 40 hours and y'all... Uh. <laughs> Sometimes when we think we got it all figured out, we're, we're so good at what we do and we've got God built in such a box, we miss it. And we, we're, we're going to tell God what he's going to do and how he's going to do it and how he's going to get it done. And while we're busy constructing and logically laying it out, we're missing the very thing God's doing in front of us because we've missed by perception. We've missed. We cannot behold because I've never experienced God that way. I've never known God to do it this way. I wasn't taught that way. My tradition says God can't do it that way. And God is saying to the prophet Isaiah, wait, 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 wait. Come over here and look at this. Quit telling me that I can't do what I want to do because I'm the one that made everything that can be done, right? Let me, let me see if I can illustrate this. I'm feeling a little, y'all moving slow a little bit. When, when I was a kid, now you, if you're young, you're not that you have to be old. If you are vintage, if you are vintage, you will understand what I'm about to say. I grew up in a generation. Now, how many of you remember the first remote control TV you ever saw? You remember that? I remember the first one. It had a cord on it the size of a, of a garden hose, and it, it was connected to the TV, and it was remote control because you could turn it off and on without going over to it. Now, you could use the cord to pull your tractor out of a hole. That's how big it was. And we had, my father had a remote control TV before remote control t TVs were ever a thing, uh, and we didn't have cable. How do you remember? We, we had three stations, had three stations, ABC, NBC, CBS. Then you had the UHF, which we called the Tarzan channel. Y'all remember that? Yep. And it, we had a very sophisticated setup with no cable. We had, uh, because my dad was very frugal, we had a large TV uh, about the size of this building. And um, <laughs> a large TV had massive speakers. You could raise like the Waltons in the speakers. You understand what I'm saying? And, and it had a beautiful picture. But my dad had bought it at a very good price because it had no sound. Had no sound. <laughs> yeah. And I meet these kids. My mom wouldn't buy me these tennis shoes. Shut up. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> we had a TV with no sound. <laughs> so on top of it, my dad was out one day and he found a small black and white television. that had no picture, but it had sound. <laughs> so we set the black and white on the big color TV. Yeah, we had a very sophisticated system on top of the color and the black and white. Very sophisticated. Now, because we got the color TV at a good price, it, somebody had taken the knobs off of it. So we had a very expensive set of needle nose pliers <laughs> to turn the channel. And on top of it, there was an antenna that came out of the top with an integral uh, working of clothes hangers and aluminum foil. <laughs> 
If I got lost like at night, I'd just look to the glow of a house. Wah, wah. And it, it, so my dad would, my dad, my dad could be next to the te television and he would step to the door, the back door, and he would call me by name. Jeffrey Thomas! We could be seven blocks on the other side of the neighborhood. You come running home. And you get there, and he said, I need you to change that channel. <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's just Mike. So anyway, um, you know, you take a needle nose and you change it. Well, if you had, you had to sync it, because this one had the volume, the, the audio, and this one had the video, you had to sync it. Well, if there was a problem with the antenna, my dad would say, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Check channel two, because if four wouldn't come in, it was a ball game he was watching. He was looking for something specific. Was channel four not broadcasting? Was there a reception problem? And so he would tell me, turn to channel two. Now, if channel two was broadcasting, he would say, oh, we got a reception problem. Meaning that, meaning that there are often times when the spirit of God's trying to do something. It's not that God's not speaking. The issue is not that the Spirit's not transmitting. The issue is we're not receiving. So look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, the deceiver will mess with my receiver. Well, let's do it one more time. My receiver can be messed with by the deceiver. Did you all hear about the two TV antennas that got married? Y'all need this. We're going to pause because you need this. Did y'all travel back home with me or something? Did y'all hear about the two, v, two TV antennas that got married? No. Oh, the ceremony was okay, but the reception was incredible. <laughs> you needed it. Now watch this, watch this, watch this. We gotta hurry, we gotta hurry, we gotta hurry. We're, we're, we're almost out of time. Here's the situation. They're, they're in the middle of prosperity. God's warning them pain's coming. And what he's trying to do is get them ready for the fact that don't judge, your, don't judge the heart of the Father by the hurt that you're going through. Don't do it. You're, I haven't forsaken you, I haven't forgotten you. I, 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 the theme all during the Holy Land, I'm telling you the Spirit of God fell. Holy Ghost of God. We, listen, we... <laughs> We took a, uh, some folk that, are, that have been, you know, uh, part of my preaching ministry all over the United States, from California, North Carolina, Alabama. We took a bunch of Baptists. <laughs> they are messed up right now. <laughs> they are messed up right now. Because <laughs> God just failed. And what, what was supposed to, you know, what people think is going to be a historical tour. And you're going to see, you know, nice, quaint, little, swaddle-wrapped baby Jesus we met the lion of the tribe of Judah who's on his way back. And, and he was saying, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. I want to show you something. I want to show you something. And he wrecked, he wrecked all of these preconceived ideas. Didn't step outside the authority of his word. He just took off the blinders that are saying, here's the situation and here's the invitation. I want you to come over here and notice. I want you to understand I'm about to do something in you and through you to prepare you to go where you've never been before. So watch, watch the flow. Watch the flow of the text very quickly, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to hasten to a close right, right about somewhere in a minute. <laughs> Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? Um, I tell you this because it's part of my DNA. I tell you this frequently. God doesn't play hide and go seek. He doesn't. There are times when I am very guilty of exchanging. I, sometimes I keep my problem and I leave my faith. Sometimes I keep my problem and I leave my faith. And what has to happen sometimes is the Father has to say to me through the Spirit, come over here, behold, come here and look. Jeffrey Thomas, get yourself up over here and I want to show you something. I'm about to do a new work. Now, their, their world's about to be wrecked. Their temple's about to be destroyed. The Babylonians are on the way. That's why he referred to them, the Chaldeans, same people, demonically possessed. I'm going to show you in some scriptural warfare training because of where we're going as a people. Listen to me. You've got to know this. Where we're headed and what we're, what we're about to watch God do in us and through us, I promise you this, the enemy is about to put a new bullseye on everybody that's a part of this fellowship. The intense 
uh, the intense attack, the intense warfare. Now listen to me. You're already more than a conqueror. You've already got the victory. He said you may go through the fire, but the flame's not going to burn you. The water may rise, but it's not going to overwhelm you. The problem is not that we're going through it. The problem is that sometimes we get stuck in the middle of it. Behold, behold, come here, come here, come here. I, 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 I need to do something. I need to get you ready to understand that what you're about to receive requires some preparation. Do you want to bear more fruit, much more fruit? Then I have to take the pruners and prune. I got to cut some stuff back. I, I, you're not going to produce everything I have for you if you don't let me cut some dead stuff Let me, let, me, let me tell you this as, as we really hasten to a close. Let, let me say this to you. I've been through enough to know that Jesus is enough to get me through. I've been through enough to know that Jesus is enough to get me through. And sometimes I struggle personally in my own walk with the Father that when he comes into my life and he says, listen, I know all this stuff that's coming. I understand the demonic oppression of the Chaldeans. You're talking about a picture. You're talking about so much so that the Apostle Paul is going to bring them up in the New Testament. I'm going to teach you in a few weeks. I'm going to teach you how to spot, how to spot the Chaldeans. They are lying, subversive, counterfeit works of the Spirit that will infiltrate and come into your life and pull you away from intimacy with the Father. They are lying, deceiving, and they always want to destroy the temple of God. In fact, prophetically, there is but one race of people that do not exist in the millennial kingdom or in eternity future and they are called the Chaldeans. Uh, they're related to the Edomites because they put their hands on the temple of God and burned it to the ground. They destroyed it. Listen to me very carefully. You need to understand something. Satan is not going to sit by in East Knox and just let us take back what he has possessed for so long. He is not going to just relinquish control of the minds of our children, of, of, the, of the control of our homes, our wives lives are being spoken to by sadistic, and I'm going to say it because, bless God, I've got jet lag, and I'll blame it on that. A bunch of baby-killing, brawl-burning, feminazi women that could, would not submit to Jesus, much less a man, and I'm telling you in Jesus' name, that book right there is the final authority, and it isn't about you being a woman, lady. It's about you being a woman of God. And by, while, I'm on the, while I'm in the neighborhood... If some of these men that get up off their blessed assurance and stand up and be a leader in the house of God, and I don't mean be cruel, I, I don't mean be, be mean-spirited, I love her as Christ loves the church, but there comes a point in time when I say, debate's over. Debate's over. It's over. We're having something fried. Bless God, woman, get in there. We're eating something fried. Amen? We're going to have a little salad tonight your cholesterol. Here, eat this kumquat. Woman, it better be fried. Woman, I'm telling you, it better have bacon wrapped around it, bless God, and an Oreo stuck up inside of it. I'm the man of this house. Get in there and fry that thing. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Y'all all right? Yeah. I'm not going to remember any of this. <laughs> there are times when God gets ready to do his deepest work in us, but he's got to prepare us to receive it. You understand? Because the deceiver will mess with my receiver and it'll skew everything and get me. So I can't even receive the fact that he's about to do a new work because I've already let the enemy accuse me of my past. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you all something. Now, you know, I get in trouble for doing this because I'm so blasted transparent and I've been told in fact, I think I shared with this if, you've been, if you, you were here in the beginning when I got here for the first half of the tribulation. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That was, that's just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. When, when we first moved here, um, I shared this with some of you. I actually, uh, don't anybody say anything while I'm through with this story. Um, I actually flunked preaching in seminary. I failed preaching. Uh, my seminary professor flunked me. <laughs> and he said in his critique of me, uh, number one, you will not stand still. That's what he said. <laughs> and uh, he said, number two, you are entirely, you are entirely, you, you are too personal. 
You tell stuff on yourself. You, you just should not, you need to present a, a more eloquent, uh, what was the word? Pedigreed. <laughs> <laughs> Professional. <laughs> In the pulpit. You don't need to share all that personal stuff. I'm on this platform because I'm built low. <laughs> not because I'm above you. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> and before God, he flunked me. He flunked me in preaching. He flunked me. There were some other things that ain't none of your business. So <laughs> he flunked me in preaching. Now, my wife had already spoken a word over me and told me I was out of the will of God because of where I was going to school. Because I went to get a credential not, not, not to know the Father better. And she told me, she said, you're out of the will of God. You're not supposed to be in that school and it's going, you're going to flunk everything. I said, woman, get in there and fry something. No, that's not what I said. That's not what I said. So here, here's, listen to me. Here, here's, here's, here's my point. Listen to me. I get in trouble sometimes for being so transparent with you, but I need you to understand something like you don't already. You, you, you have a pastor that has clay feet, human. There ain't nothing you're going through that I ain't been tempted to do. Do you understand that? And we got a Savior that was tempted at all points and failed at none. I turned 50, and, and, and my people don't live long. <laughs> now, a lot of it has to do with the way they live. So I've cleaned that thing up a little bit. You know, I'm, I've probably got more time than they do. But it really hit me hard when I turned 50. I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not really in the fourth quarter, but I can see the clock ticking. You understand what I'm saying? And I started taking stuff in consideration like, okay, well, um, you know, this is, this is probably our last assignment. You know, we, we, we're going to give the rest of our life to this and we, 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 all that. And I got Aunt Dot and I, I want to finish well. I'm on, and so I started thinking about stuff about my mortality. I was sitting with um, Aunt Dot uh, at, um, in her home where she was born. And uh, we were, she'd broken her hip, come back home, that kind of thing. And... Um, I said to Aunt Dot, because our family was brought up, don't ever talk about anything bad. We just ignore it like it's not going to be there. You know, don't talk about death or burials. Whoever's here when I die, they'll take care of it. And that's a very hard thing to leave on people. So I said to Aunt Dot, I said, you know, Christy and I are responsible, and I want to honor you, um, not that you're, you know, going to die now, but Oh, uh, you ain't a spring chicken. I mean, let's just get, and I need to know what, what do you want to do? And she said, oh, I got a policy. I got a policy. I said, really? You have a burial policy? She said, oh, yeah, it's paid up, paid up. She went and got it and brought it to me. And uh, she laid down on the kitchen table, and there was a number. I called, this, I called the number. <laughs> and this very nice lady answered, and I said, I'm who I am, and, and this is Aunt Dot. And we understand you have a policy. She said, yes, sir, let me pull it up. She, so she said, yeah, yeah, Dorothy Lee Boyd has a policy. I said, well, what does it cover? She said, well, Miss Boyd, 15 years ago, bought, she picked out her casket, and it's as close to hot pink as you can get. <laughs> and she has paid for her, um, her dress, and she has uh, paid for her beauty salon visit. <laughs> Put some Aquanet in there. What, what? What is the deal? You charge her for beauty. I said, what is a beauty? Why would you charge somebody for beauty? She said, well, we got to put her makeup on. I said, she doesn't wear makeup. I said, this, this is not Tammy Faye Laborde. This is Ann Dot. So I said, well, what else we got? She said, that's it. I said, no, you don't understand. I mean, what else we got? She said, what's well, it? So I put the phone on mute, and I said, Aunt Dot, um, we got a box. <laughs> we got a beauty salon, <laughs> and we got the dress. Well, you know, we got to buy a plot. <laughs> well, we can't just take you home and put you in the garage. I mean, what are we, what are we going to do? I mean, come on. And Aunt Dot's very, you know, she just matter of fact who she is. She's like, well, I wasn't worried about that. I said, Aunt Dog, do you know, I mean, a cemetery plot. Then we got to buy the stone. I said, that, that, that. so I unmuted the phone. I said to the lady, I said, ma'am, let me ask you something. Um, you mean we have nowhere to put her? She said, yes. I said, great. We got her all dressed up, nowhere to go. That's wonderful. That's beautiful. That's great. Well, Aunt Dog, she, she's, she's broke. I mean, you know, she, she just, country folks, didn't, never had anything. She lives in the house she's born in. Christy and I bought the car she drives. She just, you know, she's worked hard. She's never had a lot of money. 
So I said to the lady, ma'am, um, this is where she wants to be buried, and this is what we think she wants on the stone. <laughs> um, can you give me an estimate? Could you tell me if, if, if my wife and I want to try to pay for that, what would it cost? And she said, yes, sir. And I could hear it. It just kept going. <laughs> And I looked at Aunt Dot and I said, you're going to the garage. You are going to the garage. We are going to stuff you and stick you in the foyer with an offering plate. <laughs> She's just laughing and cackling and carrying on. She said, Ain't my problem. I'm going to look good. <laughs> so the woman finally comes back on and, and I'm looking at Aunt Dot and she's looking at me and I'm thinking, what were you thinking? And the woman said this. She said, oh, sir, uh, you know, this is an estimate, but, you know, to open the grave and put, put, put the remains and all that, she said, the stone, you're looking at uh, estimated $10,000. I'm in the wrong business. I preach to the dead. Pay me to bury them, dear God. I mean, not you, but you know what I'm saying. So, I said, $10,000? She said, yes. I said, thank you for your time. <laughs> Aunt Dot's not saying anything. We don't, she doesn't have $10. <laughs> and so we sat there a few minutes, and uh, we just, I led Aunt Dot to the Lord just a little over 10 years ago, and I've been teaching her how to believe God for stuff because she was never taught you could ask the Father, and he'd bring it. But I'm in the flesh. I'm thinking, $10,000. What are we, we, we going to get that? So I looked across the table and I said, Aunt Dot, we got a problem. She said, well, you said we could pray about it. <laughs> just like that. You told me we'd just ask God and he'd bring it. And I, and I wanted to say, look, sister, I'm the preacher. You hush. That's what I wanted to say. But I didn't. Shut up. I didn't. I said, you're right. You're right. We haven't prayed. Now, what I'm about to tell you sounds like an exaggerated, inflated preacher tale. But I call the Holy Ghost as my witness. We prayed at the table. I kissed her on the head like I always do. I prayed a prayer of blessing over her. And I pulled out. She lives at the mouth of a holler. Do you all understand what I'm saying? Her people founded that holler. Her daddy bought it in 1901 for 27 cents an acre. And there were tobacco farmers. I pulled out because she's the last house in the holler. You do not check Aunt Dot's mail. You don't check her mail. The mailbox has her daddy's name on it. He had it made in 1927. It's wrought iron. You don't check the mail. That's her deal. I head down the road, and the Holy Ghost said, you need to go back. I said, for what? You got to check the mail. I said, uh, <laughs> have you met Aunt Dot? <laughs> I ain't checking the mail. I, I went on to the end of the holler, and the Holy Ghost said, you need to go back and check the mail. So I turn around. I go back to the end of the holler where she lives up on the hill, and I pull around to the mailbox. She's still standing at the door. Normally, she would have come on down to check the mail. I open the mailbox up, and I walk up the ramp. There's an envelope. I said, Aunt Dot, there's something that looks a little odd here. Um, I want you to open it before I leave. It was a letter from a lawyer. Now, Aunt Dot wouldn't call him her boyfriend, <laughs> but when they were in their uh, late 70s, they started sparking they, they went out to eat together. He'd passed away a month before. While we were at that table praying, God send a raven with meat, cause a brook to flow with sufficient funds, I heard the mailman pull up, close the mailbox. In that envelope from a, from a lawyer in Robertson County, Tennessee, was a letter that said, um, Miss Boy, your friend left you exactly $10,000. Now listen to me. That's not a lot of money to some of y'all. That's a lot of money. Yeah. That's a lot of money. Yeah. It wasn't the money. No. It was behold. Come over here. Yeah. I want to show you something. Before you get on the road to go back 
to act all big and mighty would you preach yourself? Let me take you to an old-fashioned mailbox and remind you, I'm going to do a new thing. And you're going to see rivers flow where there was desert and fruit bloom where there was famine. Get ready, Fairview. It's on its way. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that, Lord, not, not the money. I, I'm not asking you about the, the financial. That's all going to come. I, I'm, I'm asking you for the faith. I mean to really begin to believe you at a level that when the Spirit of God says, Behold, come over here. Come over here and watch what I'm about to do. That regardless of the sadness of the moment or the circumstances, regardless of what we're going through in the temporal, I, I'm asking you, God, give us, give us a heart that says, Wait a minute, the Spirit's doing something new. <laughs> And I pray we'd run to the balcony of our relationship with you and peer over and say, God, show me what can only be from the heart and the hand of my Abba. I, I speak against fear in this room. There are those, God, who have already made up their mind. I don't have anything to give. I, I don't have anything to contribute to where we're going. I rebuke that in Jesus' name. Because you're not broke and heaven... Heaven has a bounty. You said you'd open up the windows. So I pray that you'd begin to prune and prepare, get us ready. And I pray for that one sitting in this room who season after season, service after service, has sensed the Spirit of God saying, come on, this is your home, this is your family. Make covenant. I pray this morning they'd obey your Spirit. Come take the hand of Pastor C.H. and say, this is, this is my place, these are my people. And I want to serve my God and go with him standing on the promises. For that one who doesn't know you, in Jesus' name, may the scales fall. May the heart surrender. And I pray right where they sit, they'd say something simple like this by faith. Lord, I'm a sinner. Save me. Receive me as your child. For I confess you as my Messiah. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you rise, beloved? Pastors are going to be joining me. If you're in the balcony and you just don't want to make the trek down, I don't blame you. There's a safe place right up there. There'll be some ministers. They're going to be waiting to pray and stand in faith with you. Altars are open. God's calling. You come. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center Jesus, you nothing else.
Pastor Siege is um, laboring to uh, let us behold what the Lord's done today in our midst. So as he gets ready to do that, I want to, I'm, I'm in obedience, I want to minister just for a moment. If you would, just right where you are, just um, as we learned this past week, just tabernacle where you are, just in the spirit, just just heads bowed, whatever, however you express. I, that's so religious. I don't want to say it that way. You may want to turn your face toward heaven hands high, I, I, whatever is tabernacling with you. Father, I just sense in a very unique way today, both services, just in glorious presence of possibility. And if there is, if there is in the spiritual realm a consistent being spoken over this church right now, it is, behold, come look. Come and see the goodness of God. So I pray in, a, in obedience, not in arrogance, not in my own confidence. Lord, we, we bind our hearts together in, a, in agreement with your word that as it is in heaven, so let it be right here on earth. There's some folks in this room hurting. There's some online hiding behind a screen. And that doesn't make them bad. It doesn't even make them wrong but they got wounded. And the spirit of religion, the spear of Saul, pinned them against the wall because like David, they were just following you. So I pray that in the next few days that you would so invite those that need to see you in a new, fresh way. They, they need a stream in the desert. They need a raven with meat in his beak I pray in the next few days it would be noised abroad. You won't believe what God did. And you will invite them to come over and behold, I'm doing a new thing. And I pray very specifically for whoever you are listening in this room, wherever you are. I pray this in the name of Jesus. You can't do anything about your beginning. You can't do anything about what you used to be. But in this moment, God is saying, don't worry about your beginning. You can make all the difference in your ending. Today's a new start. You don't have to finish like you started. So in Jesus' name, I pray, release them from fear and let them in the next few days see something that can only be explained from the hand of their Abba. And all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Just, just.